Welcome to the after lunch session. We're uh, covering data and technology and we're going from uh, ultra scan machines to uh, international databases and electronic medical records. So quite a, a broad uh, series of talks from our five speakers. Um, so again, just a reminder, all you Twitterati, uh, it's hashtag uh, cancer innovations if you want to keep the conversation going, as uh, Tony Jones says. Um, so, um, <laughs> So what we'll do, we'll, we'll kick off um, the, the first uh, speaker, which is Vanessa Connors uh, from the Radiation Oncology Department at uh, Coffs Harbour, who's going to talk about the use of bladder scanners at simulation to achieve consistent full bladder volumes. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the uh, Cancer Institute of New South Wales for this opportunity to present the work we've done at the North Coast Cancer Institute. Uh, the North Coast Cancer Institute operates across three sites on the Mid-North Coast. We're located at Lismore, Coffs Harbour and Port Macquarie. 25% of our workload is made up of prostate radiation therapy patients that require a full bladder and an empty rectum. And this is to help decrease their toxicities to the bladder, rectum and small bowel. Non-compliance with the required bladder preparation was having a large impact at all centres and it was becoming apparent that patients were often struggling to fill their bladder to the required volumes or were overfilling and becoming uncomfortable. So during treatment, if a patient does not have the required bladder volume, we would take the patients off the couch to resolve their bladder problems before we could continue to, de to deliver their treatment. The emphasis on bladder filling was becoming very stressful for the patients and for the staff. Sorry. So an in-house study was conducted at the North Coast Cancer Institute to increase bladder volume reproducibility for prostate radiation therapy patients through the development of a method of assessing bladder uh, volumes at CT simulation using a Verithon 9400 bladder volume instrument. Filling techniques and time delay variations were in explored in order to establish a procedure that would increase consistency and compliance of patients. 524 bladder volumes were analysed from our prostate planning assessment data that had been collected between November 2008 and November 2011. The data showed that bladder volumes sizes ranged from 40.7 millimetres to 1.5 litres, with the average bladder volume between 300, oh, with the average being 321.2. As seen on the graph, these bladder volumes were compared to the V50 less than 50 gray, which is 50% of the bladder receiving 50 gray. Uh, this uh, uh, the constraint, um, if we can keep it below the 50 gray, ensures we can reduce the toxicity to the bladder and the small bowel. So we concluded that if we're aiming for a bladder volume between 250 and 350 mils, chances of exceeding this constraint was reduced to less than 5%. So initially we conducted a pilot study with five patients. They were asked to arrive at the CT simulation appointment one hour beforehand and without filling their bladder. They were then given instructions to empty their bowel and bladder in the bathrooms provided and given 600 mils of water. <laughs> a bladder scanner was performed 30 minutes post drinking, 45 minutes post drinking and an hour post drinking. If at any one of these scanning points their bladder volume was greater than 250 mils, we would proceed through with the setup and CT scan. Using an Excel spreadsheet, we recorded the bladder volumes at each of those time periods, the approximate time between the last bladder scan and the CT scan, the volume of the bladder outlined on our planning uh, scans, um, and a comment related to how their general hydration is. We also recorded weekly CT home beam scans that were taken on the machine, a comment for each of those. So the aim of the pilot study was just to identify any issues with the proposed bladder scan process before we went to a larger group. So one of the first obstacles we discovered was the 100 mil variation seen between the, measure, the bladder scanner volume and our focal contour volume. The average time between the last bladder scan and the CT scan was approximately 10 minutes. 
This time delay did not significantly contribute to the variation that was being found. This led us to invite the product representative to all three departments in order to recalibrate the bladder scanners. It also had been a number of years since formal training was conducted on the bladder scanner, and during this time, many new staff had started working in the department. This hands-on in-service held by the product representative decreased variation seen from human error. And we're also notified that there is to be expected a discrepancy of approximately plus or minus 15, plus or minus 15% when using the bladder volume, a bladder scanner. So even after the calibration and staff training, there was still a discrepancy. Taking this into account, we changed our minimum bladder volume when scanning to equal to or greater 150 mils. So the main study was conducted with 17 patients and we asked them to follow the same instructions as given to those in the pilot study. Patients deemed ineligible from the study were patient, or prostate bed patients that had not had bloods taken prior to their simulation appointment, as it's hard to stick to a one hour time slot when waiting for blood results, and patients with restricted fluid intake, such as those on certain medications, either heart medication, and those with renal failure, and on daily dialysis. So we've changed our practice and bloods are now taken and tested the day before the CT appointment just to ensure there's no delays. Part of our staff training included a generalisation CT scan comment generated at treatment time. Staff were asked to use the following template. So your bladder equals a quarter, half, three quarters, more or equal to our plan volume. The rectum is good, too much gas or too much matter and our moves were either greater or less than three mils. And if we had to re-educate the patient on either bladder filling or, empty rec or emptying their rectum. So the resulting comments were then categorized into five groups. So we had the bladder equal plan, bladder greater than plan, or bladder greater or equal to half. And these are all in the blue, which equal a pass. This means the patient could continue on to treatment without being taken off the bed. The red group, which is the bladder, is less than half or too large, and rectal issues equal a fail, which means the patient's taken off the bed to either fill their bladder, empty their bladder, or sort out their bowel issues. So the data collected from the 17 patients in the bladder scanning group were compared to 17 patients who did not follow the procedure, but were still having treatment at the same time. The bladder scanning co had a bladder volume between 221.2 to 588.1 cc's. The data retrospectively collected from the non-bladder scanner group illustrated a much larger range of 184.2 to 756.5 cc. The maximum V50 from the bladder scanning group was 46.4%, with the average being 24, and the maximum V50 for the non-bladder scanner group was higher at 50.9, with the average being 27.3. When looking at the weekly cone beam CT scan comments, the non-bladder scanner group were able to proceed to treatment on the basis of a pass only 75% of the time, whereas the bladder scanning group were evaluated as a pass 92.7% of the time. So this increase is in order about 17.7% compliance. So overall, the results are being positive and show the bladder scanner is a useful tool in helping achieve consistent and appropriate size bladder volumes in prostate patients. Because of these findings, we have revised our current patient bladder preparation letters and bladder filling procedures. Our dietitians also refine their bowel preparation requirements and we have introduced the use of daily magnesium supplements in an attempt to decrease bowel issues. From CT simulation, patients are now asked to arrive 45 minutes early to simulation where they are instructed to drink 600 mils of water. The bladder scanner is then used to assess the bladder volume after 45 minutes and the criteria and we proceed to the procedure if the bladder is greater or equal to 150 mils. The final bladder volumes recorded in the bladder and bowel assessment, which is then transferred to our site set up for easy reference during treatment. And the success of the bladder scanner has been extended to all bladder filling patients throughout the department. 
So currently on treatment, we're using this flow chart when the bladder scanner is needed to help assist patients with bladder filling. The volume to aim for on the bladder scanner will be recorded from simulation. If the volume is not reached in 45 minutes, clinical judgments to be used whether the patient may be required to drink more water or wait an additional 15 minutes before being re-scanned. Currently we are focusing our efforts into refining the bladder scanner on treatment and whether it should be used routinely on day one to three or if it should remain at an at-needs basis. In the near future, we also hope to explore the need to individualise drinking amounts and time delays. So recently we have, re we have gone back and analysed results from the past few months and in May we carried out an audit on 20 Coffs Harbour patients to see if we're still achieving acceptable compliance. 620 images were analysed and of these only 22 failed. 11 were due to bowel and 11 were due to bladder. So this is a further increase in compliance, which is about 3.8 compared to last time, but it gives us an overall compliance of 96.5%. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Leah Cramp and Marie Woods for all their hard work into this study and to the team at NCCI for all their data recording. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, anyone got any questions? Uh, uncross your legs and come to the front of the uh, auditorium. Uh, extra cup of coffee. Um, just a quick question. Have you had much difficulty with um, uh, inter-observer variability in one RT to another? Do you want to just comment on um, if you've looked at that at, at all? Um, initially, when we had our training, it really highlighted the the, the different ways that many of us use that used it. Even after the training, there was probably two or three that took charge. I, myself was one and there was another lady that we really tried to put the training into practice, but people just won't seem to follow. So usually one RT will try and if they don't actually get a volume, they'll come and find someone who's a bit more experienced to see if they can get more of a volume so we can t continue on to treatment. Um, at this stage, we just can't seem to get the staff as ex as excited as is what we are about our bladder scanner. So. Okay, thank, thank you, Vanessa. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Tim Shaw from the University of Sydney. He's going to be talking about a, a new sort of the QStream e-learning method to uh, look at best practice cancer care through uh, knowledge retention, sort of following on a lot of the primary care talks we've had this morning. Thanks very much. And I was trying to think of a segue between that talk and mine. And uh, um, QStream was actually developed by a urologist, perhaps hence the name. So I think there is, there is a connection there. Um, anyway, look, um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that this is a, a project that was funded by uh, Cancer Australia. And uh, I know Lauren Deutsch is in the, um, in the audience and, and, and um, Rob Sutherland. And then we, I also work with Vivian Milch, Sue Sinclair and Kathleen Mahoney. And obviously my team at, at Wedge, which is uh, Bobby Moore and James Nicholson. So I, I guess before I'd start, I wanted to just lift a little bit out from, from kind of education and look at the challenge we face. Uh, I mean, really, if you look at a theatre like us, uh, it's been known for a long time that this is the worst possible place to kind of go to actually learn and change your practice. I mean, that's not why we're here. There's a whole part of reasons to go to conferences and it's networking, all those types of things. But we know that it's bad at changing practice. Um, if you look at e-learning, the evidence is pretty poor around that as well. If you really dig around, there's not a lot of evidence. There's a big paper came out from the US last year around looking at um, studies in, in high schools, actually, and, and medical CPD, and the evidence is pretty weak. And I think the other key thing with, with online learning is that it's pretty damn boring a lot of the time. There's a lot of really boring stuff out there. How, how many people have done an online course that just blew their socks off? <laughs> One. That's fantastic. I'll have to talk to you later. <laughs> Um, so, I guess the other challenge as well when you're talking about education, and I have to say I snuck off and slipped, slipped this in after John's talk earlier on, um, but education is just part of the jigsaw puzzle of implementation science. And, and, and if you, so many educational products and, are developed and put totally out of context of the, of the broader implementation. Um, I now call myself an implementation scientist rather than an educationist. It's better for funding. But also, um, it is a reflection that I think that, that education needs to be considered. If you want to actually have change in practice, then you've got to consider it in the broader context of, of practice and service delivery. 
So what did, what did we try and achieve with this project? We were trying to develop a program um, for general practitioners. This evidence-based appeals to busy GPs uh, and, as I said, impacts on their, on their practice. So what I, I, I was lucky enough to spend a year at Harvard Medical School about four years ago, and I met um, Price Kerfoot, who's the urologist that created QStream. And um, it just really captured my attention. And, and I, I kind of call it, or he does as well, anti-online learning or, or perhaps micro-learning. It's, it's kind of deconstructing um, online learning down to some really small bite-sized pieces. Now, he's a surgeon, so that's what surgeons kind of do kind of fits in the border almost with incidental learning. So it's the kind of learning you do as, it kind of, as you move through life. Um, so to give a bit of a background to, uh, I've called it Space Education, it's, it was a, a company spun out of Harvard and it was originally called Space Ed, now it's called um, QStream. So I mix that up sometimes. So it's, it's, it was a highly evidence-based program. Um, it has impressive published results and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those in a moment. Um, what grabbed me was that it's been very well received by clinicians on the whole. Um, it takes little time to complete. It's very scalable. And, and you get instant feedback on performance. It, it's based on two effects in education, one, one of which I think everybody knows that if you test somebody on something, they tend to catch their attention. They remember it better than sending them a whole pile of passive material. But the second trick that Price um, combined with this is the psychological finding that if you if you repeat information over time, you get much, much better retention of memory. And we're starting now to show um, actual significant behavior change. Advertisers have known that forever. That's why your kids' uh, adverts are repeated over and over again so they, they force you to go and buy something. It's the repetitive nature of that, not in case you missed it. Um, so just a little bit about the data of space education um, or QStream. This, this is the slide that I first saw that Price presented. At a, he, he's a VA, he's a veteran affairs um, surgeon. And um, so he has the luxury of a full electronic record to um, do experiments with. And the square box, the small square box there, he ran a, um, a, a small QStream program over um, about a, um, a half a year's period, a bit over a year. This was with primary care doctors. And then he tracked them out over a period of time this, and was looking at their inappropriate PSA screening. He did inappropriate because there's not a lot of argument about inappropriate. And he managed to show a really quite significant drop. This is from just doing a small online course in their practice. And you can see it's actually sustained out to 108 weeks there. The line I really like there is that dotted line you can see, which is the USPSTF. I'm not sure what that stands for. But it's, um, it's basically where the government did a massive campaign, purely coincidentally, on inappropriate PSA screening right in the middle of his study. And it had no impact on the, um, what, the, what the primary care docs were doing. It was just quite an interesting little um, side product. Um, in terms of the work I've done with QStream since then, uh, I did a study with all the interns at um, Harvard Medical School about three years ago now and showed a significant impact on safety and quality. Um, we've just done a study with um, Jane Phillips um, at Sacred Heart where we're getting some really nice pilot data around um, actually impacting on nurses' um, assessment of pain and um, also we're actually getting kicks in the actual self-reported pain scores from people doing this program. The last point, I'm running a program um, as we speak across um, about 600 nurses in Brigham and Women's um, Hospital in the US. And uh, it's just really hit a note. I've actually got competition there. I've got all the wards competing with each other. And it's become quite a furious battle. But um, I got this lovely quote the other night that it was about the most, most talked about educational activity in the memory of hospital leaders. As an educationist, that's kind of just a beautiful feedback. You couldn't hope, I could go away and die now and be a happy man. Um, so what does it look like? It's terribly simple. Um, these are just four screenshots that Bobby did up um, of one of the questions we have in the QStream program. So all you do is you're presented with a, with a case, the, the top left. Um, we put a lot of work into developing really sharp cases um, with short answers. And then you have four or five short answer questions. Um, it's not rocket science. You submit that. Um, you're then on the top um, right. You're given feedback on your performance versus your peers. Um, and, and then down the bottom, which you won't be able to read, um, you're given really succinct feedback and links out to um, resources and data around that. What we're starting to actually do is put actual hospital data in that feedback 
as a kind of an audit and feedback tool, which I think is reinforcing again. And in the, in the Boston programs, I actually went and shot a pilot where I got the chief nurses to shoot um, just with their iPhone pictures of the nurses. And we've actually got the nurses in, 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 the, in the cases. So again, it's kind of reinforcing this really tight learning. So you just get a couple of cases a day, you answer them, and then over time they repeat, and you've got to answer them twice to retire them. And that's it. It's that simple. Um, and what we're finding is we're having this significant impact on, certainly on knowledge, there's no doubt about that. Tr Price has done a dozen randomized trials around knowledge. It's a no-brainer with that. But we're starting to see impacts on, on behavior as well, as I said. So what we did was we developed two programs aimed at GPs around um, management of breast cancer and, and um, diagnosis and referral for lung cancer. Um, it's a small pilot we've done, I have to say. We've only got about 20 people in each pilot at this moment, but it's, it's getting much larger. We're, we're, we're rolling that out to a larger cohort at the moment. Um, what we found, which surprised me, we ran this over Christmas last year. We got over 80 percent um, completion rates amongst both groups, um, exactly the same completion rate, actually. And um, I thought we'd just disaster running at Christmas, never run anything at Christmas. But they, they kept up with it, because it runs for about six weeks. You have about maybe a dozen questions, and by the time you've answered them, they, they roll out over a six-week period. The feedback we got was interesting. Um, in the breast one on the right-hand side, we had very strong positive feedback about they wanted to do more. They, they thought the scenarios were realistic. In the lung cancer one, I think because we were really much more specific about diagnosis, they didn't enjoy it as much, um, which was interesting feedback as well. But it, the last point, which I think is really interesting, was they still found it as a really neat way of getting information out around guidelines and change in practice, which I think is one of its um, key strengths qualitative kind of feedback from um, surveys that we ran. Uh, it was a mix of GPs and nurses. This is the typical kind of feedback you get with QStream. Some people write back said, I hated it. They don't like the re repetition. You're always going to get that in any course. But generally, we get very strong positive feedback like this. Um, I won't bother reading those out. Most of the kind of more critical feedback was actually built around um, the lung cancer cases where they just found them too simplistic. Um, and so we're going back and, and, and revising that at the moment. So um, in, in terms of, of the findings, I think I was really pleased. It's one of the first studies I've done in Australia with GPs, and, and it, was, it was well accepted by the pilot group. Obviously, that's a small group. We've got to do it with more people. Um, I, I think it was interesting, and, and this is something, again, as an educator, is that you can have the same program, drop it into different environments, change things slightly, and get massively different kind of feedback results. So I think small differences in the program, you've got to get the cases right um, to get the program running as well. Um, I, I think people preferred breast cancer as well. I think it's just a better, it was, it was a more engaging area than the lung cancer. Um, and I think... Um, one of the key things is I'm just starting the analysis now on what, what questions people got wrong. So you then start to look and say, and, and it's quite consistent. People tended to get certain questions wrong, and you've got to work out whether it's just a bad question. Assuming it's not a bad question, then, then you're getting data around what kind of education we can develop to focus on further. So just, just in conclusion, um, I think what we're looking at now is how, how can products like QStream, this kind of micro-learning, um, how can we get them out to broader groups of GPs? Uh, again, how can we make this part of a broader program? So we're, we're, we're looking at lung cancer across um, um, a number of sites at the moment in, in my role in the Catalyst Translational Research Centre. So I mean, it would be nice to put something like this in alongside the kind of systems change and other things that um, John and others were referring to um, this morning. Uh, and, and that last point I've just put in there, it, 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 the Boston study I'm doing at the moment, I threw the competition, I threw competition amongst the nurses in as an afterthought, and that's what's been totally driving it. I've been having nurses, talking to nurses, we de-identify them, we've given them all rock band names, so they'll be like Bow Wow Wow and Pink and things like that. And they're, they're actually, we're getting feedback from the floor that they're all going up to each other saying, are you Pink? You're beating me. And so they're actually having this big competition now about, about how they're answering the questions on leaderboards and things like that. So I think, you know, we need to think how we use different methods to engage people in, in educational um, initiatives and programs. I'll stop there. Thank you, Tim. Um, any, any questions from, uh, from the audience? Yeah, that's fine. Tim. Um, we're working with the Cancer Institute at the moment developing an e-health system which will have uh, it tr try and encourage patient self-management as well as you know patient reported outcomes, mm -hmm. driving mm -hmm. care etc. 
Can you see, I, I, my mind started ticking yeah. over about whether this might be adaptable for patients in sort of the yeah. survivorship uh, stage? I think it's example. a really interesting idea. Yeah. When, when I was actually in the States, I, I happened, um, Karen, my wife, was on a fellowship here, you know, and there was, a, there was another person who was on a fellowship with us who was a diabetologist, and we actually created a program for fun um, for patients about um, that initial period of, of diagnosis with diabetes and how you handle that. I think we didn't, we never really, we ran out of time to really test it properly. I think it has huge potential because it also pops up on your iPhone. It's all the kind of things that, that patients use. So I think it has, yeah, and it's that reminder function. I think, I think it's a very interesting point. Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. So our next uh, speaker is from um, St. George Hospital, and it's uh, Rosalind Rastuccia, and uh, Admir is going to come up and help. So this is going to be a Prezi presentation, so again, anybody who's got vitigo, uh, hang on tight. Uh, and so this is, again, just following on around now, bringing um, information uh, to patients and also to uh, referring clinicians. Uh, so this is the ClinTrial Refer, uh, a mobile application to connect patients with local clinical trials. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, so I'm hoping everyone's paying attention because there's going to be a test at the end of this and I'm going to be repeating myself constantly. <laughs> okay, um, and we're also being a bit innovative here. We haven't got a PowerPoint de demonstration for you. I'm Rosalind from the Hematology Clinical Research Unit at St George Hospital. And this is Admir from the Concord Research Unit. And our passion, it's clinical research. And it's one of the most effective ways, I think we all know, to improve patient outcomes and offer patients a broader range of treatments. But there are significant challenges with recruiting patients to haematology malignant studies. Because there's low, often a low incidence of these cancers and there's geographical challenges in New South Wales. And we can't run all trials at all locations. It's just too expensive. If we want to offer our patients all available treatment options, then we need to refer patients between hospitals. But keeping haematologists up to date with statewide listings of research trials is really difficult. Uh, Trials open and close and change status. And we found that patients are still not being offered all the options for clinical research that they could be. And the work involved for a haematologist to transfer a patient, refer a patient from one site to another, is really difficult. And uh, it was proving a barrier to some sites. A cultural change was needed. And so technology is providing us with many new opportunities for innovation, making knowledge management so much more accessible to anyone. Ask someone under 25 a question, they'll pull out their phone. So smartphone apps have the potential to revolutionise and improve the delivery of patient care. So the Haematology Clinical Research Network of New South Wales and the ACT decided to develop an app so that we can create a current, comprehensive list of haematology trials simply at your fingertips. Called ClinTrial Refer, it's free to download from uh, all the app stores, from iTunes, from Google Play, and it went live in the stores in May just a few months ago. And haematologists can even use it during patient consultations and find out if there are any suitable trials open uh, for their patient. Uh, for example, if your patient has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you can search the list of currently available lymphoma studies uh, in New South Wales. And the patient might be interested in participating in the Australian uh, Leukaemia and Lymphomas group study called Remark. The clinician can even email the patient with the trial details using the communication tool that's built into the app. You can copy the trial registry number and go directly to the ANZ clinical trials registry for more extensive information. Oops technical impact. 
Um, uh, the investigator can also pre-screen the patient to see if they meet the eligibility criteria, the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. And they can identify which hospital the patient uh, are offering the study. And then they can go and contact the study site coordinator using the email or the phone link that's built into the app. So this is enhancing our ability to transfer, to refer patients between, site hosp between hospitals easily and quickly. And we have outcome data since May. In fact, previous referral data showed that the state was averaging around three patient referrals between hospitals per month. That's now climbed to over nine per month in just this short time. That's an, a 300% increase in referrals. And locally, clinicians can search for open trials at their own hospital, which is a handy reference tool that is always current. Anecdotally, we're seeing a rise in recruitment within the hospitals as well. And Google Analytics is a wonderful thing. ClinTrial Refer has been downloaded to over 600 users with over 15,000 screen views. And importantly, 90% of the app users are repeat users, demonstrating an engagement with the app. That is, once it's downloaded, they're using it over and over and over. The feedback from the haematologists using it is resounding. And despite its local application, the app has been accessed in over 46 countries. Probably we'll get some copyright problems there. <laughs> um, but really what I want to do is to give you some examples of the local referral system working in just these last few months. This is just a small snapshot of a few of the referrals. We can't fit them all on. A patient referred from Westmead to St George Hospital with a rare mantle cell lymphoma to be treated with TEMSA on a trial. Very few other options for that person. A 67-year-old woman with, from Gosford to Concord to participate in the DAWN study to be treated with ibrutinib for a refractory follicular lymphoma. And the list is um, becoming endless. And we're also seeing other different uses and flow-on be benefits from this app. The app is being used in MDT meetings and to make sure that all the trial options are discussed for those patients. The app's being used by registrars and residents, expanding and enforcing the trial culture into, into those, uh, that level of cult the, in their career. And we're seeing the app being used by private haematologists. And we're seeing referrals from this source, which has only been ever sporadic in the past, but now they have access, the, we're seeing uh, referrals to our hospital. And now, we're in the process of duplicating this technology uh, to two other research networks, Haematology in Victoria and uh, the Adolescent and Young Adult Network in New South Wales. And they've kindly agreed to let me uh, show their, their apps. They're not live yet, but look for them next month. Uh, and we have interest from other research groups as well, since the app is applicable to any research uh, group, uh, not just haematology. It would be suitable for breast cancer, lung studies, really anything. And finally, our wonderful cancer consumer groups are really enthusiastic about the app. The Lymphoma Australia uh, website, it recommends the app to its consumers. And Cancer Voices Australia representative has actually publicly applauded the app um, for its benefit in informing patients. So, it's free, it's easy to access, and local to the haematology network. And to use the app, you don't need to be technology savvy. You just need to take the phone out of your pocket. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rosalind and Mia. Um, any, any comments or questions from the audience? Looks less frustrating than uh, Candy Crush and, uh, and Angry Birds. <laughs> uh, 
Um, just so I guess a, a, just a comment, um, and Professor Caro might want to talk. You know, certainly one of the key aspects of all LHDs is to increase the referral of uh, patients onto clinical trials, and I think that's a terrific uh, um, opportunity for people to access it. And you're already seeing it work from oh, people yes. crossing uh, crossing great distances. So congratulations on that. Thank uh, you. Thing. All right, now we'll move uh, towards uh, sort of collaboration and international collaboration with uh, Associate Professor Shalini Vinod from uh, the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Liverpool Cancer Therapy Centre, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, rapid learning healthcare network for prediction of outcomes in lung cancer patients. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, so I guess in this day and age, as time goes on, the amount of data being generated is, is, is increasing exponentially, and we really have an explosion of evidence to sift through to try and guide our decisions um, on management. Although clinical practice guidelines seek to summarize the highest quality data, these are largely based on clinical trials performed in highly selected populations, and the question is whether their outcomes are generalizable to the general lung cancer population that you would see in clinic. So the idea of rapid learning is learning from each patient treated in the local clinical environment. Patient, tumor, and treatment data are collected and then analyzed to evaluate outcomes, which can then be used to guide future treatment practice. As we've heard today, oncology systems are becoming increasingly electronic and paper-free, and much of this data is what is routinely collected in these oncology systems. Certainly, in terms of radiotherapy, all the data can be retrieved through electronic radiotherapy planning systems, which have been around for many years. So this rapid learning environment can be used to generate prognostic tools to guide both clinicians and patients in making treatment decisions specific to their clinical scenario. It can be used to compare the outcomes of different treatment approaches and also assessing the cost effectiveness of treatment. So the aims of this study were to take a decision support tool developed in the Maastro Clinic in the Netherlands and apply it to patients treated at the Liverpool and MacArthur Cancer Therapy Centers. The questions we had were whether this tool could be commissioned in our setting and whether rapid learning could be deployed at the center with minimal resources. So this is just showing the decision support tool that was developed at the Maestro. This was based on data collection on 322 patients who were treated with radical radiotherapy for non-small cell lung cancer. A complete set of variables which could potentially affect survival was collected and was analyzed to see which remained significant in predicting survival. Any variables that were not predictive were excluded, and the final result was a nomogram containing the variables gender, who performance status, FEV1, which is the forced expiratory volume, uh, it's a pulmonary function test, PET lymph node station, and the GTV or gross tumor volume. And based on the scores, um, three risk categories were identified with different survivals. I might just wait for that little thing to go. Okay. So for this study, we used our local electronic oncology system, Mosaic, um, and treatment planning system, Exio, as the data sources. Open source tools were used to extract and analyze the data, and the inclusion criteria were those with non-metastatic, non-small cell lung cancer, um, planned for a minimum dose of 45 gray radiotherapy, and patients who had at least one fraction administered. So there was no missing data allowed for the outcome variable, which was two-year survival, and also for the tumor volume, because the model was quite sensitive to this. Missing data was allowed for the other variables of gender, performance status, FEV1, and lymph node stations. Now, we, do, we assume that the data found in the clinical data sources was correct and complete. It's really not feasible to go back and 
review this large amount of data to um, you know, check it for quality. The, the underlying hypothesis is that the amount of clinical data will compensate for any data quality issues which may or may not be present. Um, having said that, we do have to think of a way to impute missing variables, and it can be done, uh, or it was done in a couple of ways. One was using the initial Mastro data um, and using mean values of variables to then apply it to those that were missing. But the other way, um, which is slightly more sophisticated, is using this Bayesian network imputation, whereby you know, you leverage what you do know to guess what you don't know. So for example, uh, someone with uh, N0 stage would be assumed to have no PET lymph node stations positive. And this imputation does bring up some interesting features because the, the patients with lower stage or early stage disease who would be referred to radiotherapy actually were found to have a, a lower FEV1 or poorer pulmonary function and poorer performance status than those with more advanced stage. And the reason for this is because these are selected patients. They are the patients who are rejected for surgery, who are not good enough for surgery, and therefore are referred to radiotherapy. Oops, hang on. Okay. Um, so just under 4,000 lung cancer patients were identified, and this um, is showing you how we reduce the numbers. So the, the green um, refers to those in whom we know the data element or they fit the inclusion criteria. The red are those who are excluded on the basis of the criteria, and the, the gray is really the unknowns. So we start off with quite a large cohort, and then we limit it to those with stage one to three um, disease, and then we're limited to those who had a radical course of radiotherapy, then those again in whom two-year survival is known and the volume is known. And out of these just under 4,000, only 174 were actually eligible to test the model. Interestingly, what we found is um, about um, half of our uh, localized lung cancer population who come for radiotherapy are receiving um, palliative radiotherapy rather than radical radiotherapy, and that's been quite conservative with the minimum dose we chose. So in terms of um, the study population, this table is showing the comparison between the training cohort at the Mastro and the Liverpool population, similar median age and gender distribution. Um, the Liverpool patients had slightly larger tumours by 50 cc, the Liverpool patients had slightly less stage 3B and more 3A patients. And highlighted in red are the missing data elements. So 15% missing ECOG performance status, 59% missing FEV1, and we had no systematic way of recording um, the PET lymph node stations, even though PET was performed. If we don't record it, we can't pick it up on this. So just moving on to the results, when we applied the Mastro model to our local data, we found that the model did work, however, only to identify two separate risk groups, one which was a low risk group with a five-year survival of about 40%, which correlates to the blue curve from Mastro. And then what Mastro identified as a medium and high risk here, we didn't find a survival benefit, um, five-year survival, probably five to 10%. And I, th I think it actually corresponds more to the red group of the Mastro Clinic. And just also for comparison, this is the um, survival as per the TNM stage. And I guess the, there's a quite a bit of overlap here in terms of survival curves, and the prognostic model seems to be doing a better job in displaying the, the, or separating out the survival curves. So although the TNM stage is very good at predicting overall lung cancer survival, when you hone down to, the, to those patients who are getting radical radiotherapy, that it may not be as discriminatory, perhaps as a model which contains other variables, such as patients' performance status and um, respiratory function. So just in terms of discussion, we found that it was feasible to deploy what we called a rapid learning tool with minimal resources in a busy cancer clinic. And despite the fact that there were missing data and that we did not check the data for quality, we were able to have uh, apply a decision tool which did stratify patients into different risk groups. 
and this can allow learning in the real clinic environment. And potentially it could be used um, to identify patients or select patients for treatment, but also perhaps for treatment intensif intensification or even de-intensification if we thought the prognosis was poor based on those other factors. So this is still very much a work in progress. Um, we plan to use the Liverpool data to improve the model and also apply it to other centres, um, commencing at Wollongong. There are models in other cancer sites which we will also um, pilot, and that will start off with um, la larynx cancer. And it could also be used to apply to other endpoints, um, such as toxicities and cost. Thank you. Any questions? Um, Shalini, can you, uh, is, there, is there some missing data that you think is the reason why those middle and low groups don't separate? Okay, yeah, we have thought about this, and I think what's happening is that we are more likely to treat some of these patients with palliative radiotherapy than Mastro were. So I think our poor prognosis group is being treated palliative, more likely being treated palliatively and out of this cohort. So we're choosing the very best of the poor prognosis, which is meeting the medium risk. I think um, we did about 15% of our patients fell into that category, but for the master it was about 25%. So it's probably practice differences. Yeah. Thank you. So again, important looking at uh, benchmarking between centres and also giving patients some sort of real world experience on their likely outcomes from a, a treatment that we recommend. So we're going from uh, around the world back to um, what Graham will probably call God's country, the south coast of uh, New South Wales, near to where I live. Um, and so uh, we've heard already from Illawarra, Shoalhaven about their uh, EMR. And so now we're going to look at some of the quick wins that, uh, that they've got from implementing their local information system uh, to rapidly learn and inform care at Illawarra Shoalhaven LHD. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, in January 2011, uh, Illawarra Shoalhaven Cancer Services outpatients went live with an oncology information system. Uh, this combined with the recent uh, rollout of the oncology information system into the inpatient unit uh, provides a service with a complete electronic record for all cancer treatment within the district. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the use of data generated by this electronic as a sort of uh, micro rapid learning system. Uh, I'd like you to think of the entire rapid learning system process as a tree um, with rapid learning concepts uh, at the foundation of the process and then we're sort of watering it, feeding it data um, and then hopefully picking the fruit of, um, of, of this process or um, the uh, sort of improved quality of care. So last year at this conference, Amy Abernethy presented uh, on um, development of rapid learning systems and in the oncology setting. It's a pretty exciting sort of talk. Um, one of her uh, colleagues, uh, Lynn Etheridge, defined rapid learning healthcare as a model of one that generates as rapidly as possible the evidence needed to deliver a quality patient care. In this model, Learners use as much as possible, as soon as possible, for the collection of data at the point of care that can then be used to inform clinical care and service delivery. ASCO has recently developed um, a proof of concept rapid learning system called CancerLink. Uh, its vision is to assemble and analyse point of care information in a central knowledge base, which will grow smarter over time. Uh, specifically, the, aim, the system aims to do the following points, and ASCO has been able to show We'll just wait for that to go off. Um, ASCO's, sorry, I've lost my track now. Um, uh, yeah, many issues. Um, so, sorry, ASCO's been able to show proof of concept in the breast cancer setting, but it's still early days with many issues left to, to iron out. Uh, this slide's just highlighting visually the concepts of CancerLink, and um, I guess in addition to CancerLink, there's the exciting prospects that were just discussed um, by Dr Vinod today in collaboration with Dr Andre Decker and the Mastro team. Um, they're actually showing the power that a large amount of data can deliver and um, are already performing within the rapid learning system. 
on top of these great examples, we've got um, the use of IBM Supercomputer or Watson. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with uh, Watson. It won the American game show Jeopardy against two of their champions in 2011. Uh, Watson's now being used as a clinical decision tool at Memorial Sloan Kettering and has ingested more than 600,000 pieces of medical evidence and more than 2 million pages from medical journals. Uh, this is combined with an ability to aggregate all this information with that of over 1.5 million patient records. Uh, combining this sort of power and applying it to a rapid learning framework provides hope and excitement for the future. Whilst this rapid learning model has been developed on the concept of, of big data, it's also possible to apply these concepts to a localised level uh, with the aim of ach achieving similar outcomes. So what was at the core of our district's use of a rapid learning system at a local level? Uh, fundamentally, we're, we're mining data routinely generated in the course of routine clinical practice held within our system. Clinicians within cancer services identified a selection of projects to be investigated. The aim of these projects is to inform uh, patient care and service delivery. And whilst the use of data is far from a grand scheme of rapid learning system, data stored in the oncology information system provides opportunities for the data integration in support of hypothesis generation, and it also enables us to measure the effect of changes in real time, speeding up the process of change management and practice improvement. How do we gain this data and how do we ensure its quality? As my bank tells me, uh, Mr Bell, you can only pull out what you've put in. Uh, we need to ensure that the quality and completeness of data, we can do this in a number of ways, including the use of manual and automated QAs. For example, an automated report uh, run at the end, end of a clinic to inform the conditions of uncompleted data fields in a follow-up assessment that provides data for overall survival numbers. Uh, additionally, there's regular staff training, education, support. We're also working towards making it easier to enter the data as it can be, be perceived as time consuming. Uh, our current software's mouse based and we need to change this software to be less mouse centric, a more interactive product that's easily used from mobile devices as over half of our data entry is now via mobile devices. Automation of parts of the clinician's process has reduced the time spent transcribing treatment information and enabled more time to pay attention to data entry and rewarded complete data entry. So um, here, just an example is the nurses used to have to sort of transcribe what the patient's treatment had had on into a sort of purple book which the patient took with them everywhere. Um, it's time consuming and, and risk laden as well. Um, now, if they've entered all the data into the into the OMIS, it's an automated report that gives a much better picture uh, for the patient and for, for the people involved in their care. We've also entered, uh, embedded data entry into the workflow and made data points mandatory to ensure completion of data. Um, intent field, dose reduction fields are all uh, now mandatory. So we've really tried to lock down our data entry. So now that we have our data or nutrients, what fruit are we able to harvest from our rapid learning tree? Uh, firstly, just going to touch on uh, rates of phlebitis due to decarbazine within our service. Whilst there is discussion on phlebitis uh, being caused by the infusion of decarbazine in clinical trial literature, there's little to no published data on the incidence rates of phlebitis in practice. Despite the lack of reported frequency, many units have either increased infusion time lengths and or run concurrent fluids with the drug, as anecdotally they have noted increased phlebitis rates. Now, through the data entered within our system, we're now easily able to identify all patients who have either had ABVD or decarbazine single agent, and if there are any reports of acute or delayed phlebitis. Our service has been able to report that the acute phlebitis occurred in 4.5% of all of our infusions and that delayed phlebitis uh, was reported in 6% of infusions. Of, all, of the 14 uh, reported incidences, only one incident was related to single agent decarbazine. Uh, females and patients under the age of 65 were most likely to report phlebitis. So how do we act on this? Our current infusion rate for decarbazine is two hours. Uh, due to these results, we're looking to reduce the rate of single agent decarbazine uh, to the EVERQ recommended time length of one hour. Uh, this will reduce the time spent by the patient in the unit and free up treatment, time, uh, treatment chair time. We're also now more alert uh, to monitoring young women receiving uh, ABVD for signs and symptoms of phlebitis. 
Uh, further projects embarked upon in this rapid time frame, especially when we're comparing it to, um, you know, going through the old paper versions, um, was a comparison cost between concurrent infusional 5-FU uh, and the oral alternative Cape Cytobine uh, for locally advanced rectal cancer patients. We noted anecdotally that a number of complications related to central lines and postulated that the overall cost of 5-FU would be greater than that of oral uh, Cape Cytobine or the unit cost of oral Cape Cytobine. Again, we're able to easily and swiftly uh, identify all suitable patients and identify rates of central line complications experienced by patients. This data was combined with a cost analysis of the re resources required for central line insertion and maintenance. Uh, and here you can see the calculated costs uh, for the three alternate pa pathways. Total cost of Cape Cytobine uh, is about $700. Uh, for 5-FU with the pick lines, about $1,000. And then uh, with a port, you start getting into two, over $2,000. Um, so again, um, we're able to project a total cost saving for the service of around $12,000 a year for the district. So whilst we're reducing morbidity related to central line complications. Indeed, the service is able to demonstrate if the majority of suitable rectal cancer patients were commenced on Cape Cytobine instead of 5-FU uh, across the state, result in a projected cost saving of um, $224,000 uh, for the state of New South Wales. Um, a project that demonstrates most comprehensively the application of a rapid learning system to a localised setting is our current project on scheduling within the oncology daycare unit. Um, this uh, project unfortunately wasn't funded by Cancer Institute. I'm not bitter about it. Um, <laughs> the unit noted that, uh, that patient scheduled appointment times consistently ran over. The times scheduled were based on historic values and those suggested in EVQ. Uh, the inconsistent scheduling appeared to be greater with certain protocols, certain cycles and possibly certain types of patients. The end result of the inefficient, incorrect scheduling was extended wait times for patients on the day of treatment and increased stress for staff, just like it is on me at the moment. So the use of an oncology information system to its full functional provided us with such intricate data that statistically significant conclusions were able to be released. We have over 6,500 occasions of service a year to analyse. Time stamps within the OMIS provide granularity that can be mined to provide a thorough picture of the treatment time journey for a patient through the cancer care centre. So if you have a look at, um, this is a report that we've developed, um, you can see uh, that the patient's booked in for a one and a half hour appointment for Paclitaxel weekly. Uh, they were due in at 2pm, they came in, they arrived at 10 to 2 and then came in at 12 past 2. The first observation by the nurse was attended at um, 18 minutes past two, and I finally checked out at 4.10. So you can see the patient had their first drug at 2.10, but then didn't have their next drug until 2.37. So it's quite a delay between their obs time and then the starting. I mean, there's cannulation and observations to be done there, um, but here's a t sort of area that we can look to start to, to improve upon and hopefully measure very rapidly if we do make a, an adjustment, if it has an effect. Um, so you can just start to see, get a good overall picture of when the patient has their final treatment, when the, finish, uh, the treatment finishes, and then when they're uh, kicked out the door at, at 10 past four. So it's just a really good overall picture with a, a lot of granularity there to, and to start to analyse. So analysis of data collected identified discrepancy between current appointment time lengths um, again, referencing uh, EVQ suggested times and real-time appointment time lengths. On average, the scheduled appointment times were out by about 43 minutes per care plan. Uh, this becomes a significant issue if you're seeing 25 to 30 patients in a day. All this data that we're able to gain will personalise personalize scheduled tr patient treatment times, aiming to improve patient satisfaction, their treatment experience, patient safety and staff satisfaction. Additionally, we will be able to identify the major bottlenecks in the patient journey, implement quality initiatives, improve efficiencies, and measure the effect of initiatives in real-time data. So, uh, in conclusion, all these projects need not be limited to a localised project. The same data can be 
used to contribute to much larger research projects? Should we share the same reports with Liverpool or COFs if we're all using the system in the same way? And we can also benchmark. So uh, is it on average for us to be 43 minutes over time? Is that, is that normal or is um, Liverpool and Campbelltown performing much better and actually on time? Uh, the beauty of having the data collected at a localised level, level enables us to identify patterns and trends rapidly in order to generate and test new hypotheses. Through a retrospective analysis of real-time data in a rapid learning model of care, we've been able to ensure a focus on continuous innovation, quality improvement and patient safety within our service. Thank you. Thank you, Graeme. We've got time for any questions that anyone's got? Um, so I guess um, the, the good thing about that is that you've got real life, real time experiences as opposed to the, um, uh, some of the guidelines that we've got. Um, uh, are you in a position yet to sort of ask EverQ to change the um, timings of some of those uh, protocols yet or a bit more data is needed? No, I, th I think we've got enough data. Um, I guess it would be nice for, for EverQ to have data from just more than a sol solely one unit. Um, and perhaps two units or something, so that we could start to change those things. But it is definitely out. If you sort of look at an EVQ care plan and how much they want to, uh, time they want to assign to it, it's very much the infusion is going to take exactly one hour and yet other stuff is only going to take half an hour. And, you know, sure, the infusion is going to take probably an hour and five minutes instead of an hour, and then antiemetics take that extra two minutes and then you start adding them up and it starts to be a, a big, big disparity. So, um, yeah, I think... I've, We've got the data. We're now going to change all of our um, appointment time lengths to reflect that, and then we're going to measure the effect of that. Yep. Question at the front. Zephyr Badu from St George Hospital. That was very interesting. Does the can you the software adaptable to a tablet format for nurses to? Yeah. Utilize so the website? that's the idea. Um, the software is mouse based. Our idea. Um, we've just had a proof of concept done with um, with a mobile device uh, for patient reported outcomes, but transferring it to clinicians like nurses for them to be able to have an app on the front end of, of Mosaic to actually enter the data in and then it dumps across uh, into through HL7 into, into the system will make it a lot easier to enter the data. So yeah, far more usable, I guess. The, all the systems have been developed to be at a desk um, and, and we're not using them at a desk anymore. We're using them at the patient bedside um, so, yeah, we, we, we do have that ability and that's what we're looking to do in the next couple of years is really try and um, make it a lot easier for the clinicians to use. The other thing I found very interesting is your economic analysis tool. I, mean, mm -hmm. I think uh, we tend to underestimate uh, human capital mm. that, that integrates that much better. Is that fully integrated into your, uh, into your software? No, is that's that sort of, a, a, yeah, you have to pull that back, okay. pull that out. Uh, the easy part is that you're able to pull it out rapidly, like I can sit and get that the same data that would have probably taken me weeks to get, um, I can do that in an afternoon now. Um, so uh, we can look at all those patient records in an afternoon, me and another, uh, another nurse and could have a look and say, okay, here are all our complication rates and this is how much it costs. So um, yeah, it, it just enables you to do it a lot quicker and the turnover is a lot quicker. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. So I think we've heard uh, five excellent talks um, that cover a, a fair spectrum of the use of data and technology from individual patient care to ways of improving teamwork and, and uh, efficiencies in centres and then bringing out services to populations and, uh, and communities. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of the, the five speakers for uh, their excellent talks and keeping to time. I'm sure they'll be open to uh, individual questions over afternoon tea. Um, don't forget you've got your evaluation forms to fill out uh, before the end of the day. Uh, and we've got, uh, we're back at half, in half an hour for the uh, great debate. So thanks for your attention and thanks, thank the speakers again. Thank you.